Revelation chapter 20. The final test for mankind is the subject we've been looking at as we have gradually begun to take things apart to ask what is happening here? Why is it happening? Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 through 9. You remember the millennial kingdom has been completed. The thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. That thousand year reign is ended, it says in verse 7, when the thousand years are completed. Now we looked at that and realized that the word completed is teleos. That means that it has reached its goal. And we have analyzed that as to what does that mean? The goal of all of human history with all of the dispensations and the covenants and with the plan of God for all of human history has finally reached its culmination point. And it says at the end of that, that Satan will be released from his prison. Remember, he was in prison for the entire thousand years. All the demons were imprisoned also at uh, different locations, but nonetheless imprisoned. And then it says in verse 8, speaking of Satan, uh, he will come out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth. That means the whole earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on a broad plain of the earth, surrounding or surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. As amazing as it seems, at the end of a perfect world, practically perfect in every way, the great rebellion, the final great rebellion of mankind happened. And we have asked a lot of questions about that, and now we're going to be looking at the process and what when it says that Satan will come out to deceive the nations, what does that mean? Do you remember that in the coming millennial kingdom, that all of the unbelievers below or above the age of 20 and up will have been removed from planet Earth? The people going into the millennial kingdom will be composed of two different groups the immortals and the mortals. The immortals are those who have been resurrected. All the saints re resurrected from the beginning of time, Adam and Eve, all the way down through the end of the tribulation period. And we've analyzed the different resurrections that are involved. All the believers of all time will be in the coming kingdom. They will be residents of that kingdom. Among the immortals, there will be some, if not many, who are glorified. <clears throat> that is, they will have a body like unto his glorious body. It is a reportable state. But then there will be mortals that will be in the kingdom. The mortals who are in the kingdom will be tribulation survivors. Some of those will be non-glorified believers who survived the tribulation period and unbelievers. Now, if you remember, there will be believers who will be immortal but not glorified. Once again, they're in the kingdom, but they will not be mortal. They will be immortal because they have a resurrected body, but there will be they're not mortal. By mortal, I mean their body has not been changed. Out of the mortal people will come the children that will populate the planet during the millennial kingdom. You remember in our previous studies in the millennial kingdom, Jews and Gentiles, immortals, that is those who have been resurrected, will have no sin nature. Also, Jewish mortals will have no sin nature. There will be Jews who will be in their mortal bodies, but they will not have a sin nature. There will be no sinning um, of any kind among the Jewish people. Uh, but the Gentile mortals will have a sin nature and they will have uh, the opportunity and they will be producing children in great numbers. Both believers and unbelievers are part of the Gentile mortals. The unbelievers are, of course, those who are below the age of 20 who have never believed in Yeshua for his promise of eternal life going into the kingdom. 
But then also, as they produce children, those children will be born with the sin nature. They will be born spiritually dead, and they need to have the new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be analyzing some of that, mentioning it a little bit, probably here today, and then in our future classes. The rebellion is going to come from that class, not among the Jews, but will be Gentile mortals, people who have the sin nature, who have produced children for a thousand years. Uh, they will be the ones that will be involved in this great rebellion. We have also seen in previous studies, there will be both Jew and Gentile living in the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is a reward for believers, for the overcoming believers, those who are inheriting the kingdom, the bride of Christ for the church age believer. There's three residences during the millennial kingdom. The first one is that of the New Jerusalem, but then there will be also the Jerusalem, which is on the land. It is that all will be including that great mountain that will be raised up upon which will be the millennial temple and all of the Jewish land promised to Abraham uh, from the Euphrates River uh, to the river of Egypt is called. Um, some of those Jews will be glorified. Some will be mortals. And then you have both mortals and immortals, Jews and Gentiles alike, who will live on planet Earth. They're in the millennial kingdom, uh, but they are not in either one of these two places. We've studied that and analyzed it. Uh, even Jewish people who are failures during the tribulation period will be allowed to live on planet Earth, and but they will not be able to even enter the land of Israel as far as living residence is concerned. And so also Gentiles who were failures during the tribulation period will live on the earth, but they will not be a part of either aspect. Once again, living for the Jewish people in the glorified mortal state or the glorified state as well as the Jews to live in the land is also a reward. We've studied all this in the past. More mortals will be alive at this point than ever in all of human history. That's why it says they will be like the sand of the seashore. Vast numbers. For the, because from the very beginning, the Lord said, fill the earth. Fill the earth. Satan always has people around that want to say, we have too many people. We need to help depopulate. Uh, we need to have abortions. We need to we need to have people die off. We've got too many people and, and all of these other crazy things because we have to save Mother Earth. Listen, you're not going to do anything about Mother Earth. That's under the control of our almighty God. He is the creator. He started. He will end it. Uh, there's nothing man can do. So that's why I tell everybody, and some of you obey very nicely, keep having babies. But anyhow, like the sand of the sea. But then... The deception. We have to ask, why is Satan released? In part, we've already discussed it because it displays the fact that the problem is not the environment. The problem is not finances. The problem is not family. The problem is nothing, nothing except us. We ourselves are the problem. And the, everything in the millennial kingdom will be as close to perfect as it possibly can be. And... Uh, given the fact that there are still people around with said natures, and yet people will rebel against it. And Satan's release proves that the problem is man himself. We have seen, and we will continue to look at how does this fit into the perfect plan of God for the ages, and why does this event end history as we know it? Because you see, right after this comes the great white throne when everything that is now in existence is flee is it says that it, uh, it fled away it's no place were found was found for them this current creation is gone verse 11 of that passage and then comes in 21 a new heaven and a new earth so this is the last event of the last time frame of human history we looked last time that there's four steps down to destruction within this passage first off satan is released Second of all, and we'll be looking at this today, is deception. Third, he gathers his followers like the sand of the sea. And then they launch a war against God, against both the New Jerusalem as well as 
the, uh, the, the, the beloved city, the city here on planet Earth, Jerusalem and Israel. And it ends in destruction and death. The old serpent that deceives the world, it says in Revelation 12, 9. The word deceive appears some 67 times throughout the books of the Bible. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 says Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And we'll look at that in just a moment. In other words, Satan appears as that which is good. Satan appears as that which is right. Satan appears as that which is pleasing. Satan appears as that which is a help to you or to help to people, but that is part of the word deception. Planao is the Greek word for to, to deceive. Uh, it means to cause to wonder, to lead astray, or to go off course, to deviate from the correct path, or the circuit or the course in which it's supposed to go, to roam spiritually, to roam into error, and to wander away from truth, and to roam out of bounds of what is correct, out of bounds of truth. It's a powerful word. Satan cannot force anyone to follow him. But through deception, the same deception he uses now, he'll be using then, to cause people to follow him and to reject the Lord Jesus Christ and to reject all that is good. Amazingly, you know, like we... Uh, had in a, a lecture not too long ago, somebody said, change you can believe in. It's remarkable to realize that at the end of the millennial kingdom, you can see it, and this is a little extra biblical way of saying it, but people carrying signs, we want change. Change from perfection? We'll be looking at why that is. The original meaning of the word planao uh, implies something movement in, or something moving in space. We get the word planet from it. Originally, people thought, you know, the, the, the planets were in irregular orbit. They didn't recognize that they were in a stable orbit. They thought they just moved around. And so they applied the word planao to them. It is written here, in deception, he goes out to deceive in the active tense, meaning he's to lead astray. He is at the forefront of pulling people behind him to lead them astray, leading people who are following Satan is a leader, but you have a leader, you have to have followers. And amazingly, these people who will be alive in the millennial kingdom, at the end of the millennial kingdom, will want to follow him. Deception is to make lies appear as truth. Deception, deception is to make lies appear as truth. I just called it lying truth. You know, it's true for you, but it's not true for me. That's a lying truth because it denies absolute truth. Today, people don't believe in absolute truth. The reason they don't believe in absolute truth is because they have bought into lying truth, the lies of Satan. I like the word fear. Describes deception, fear, false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. We have better fear deception because it appears real. It's just like when you go into some places today and you pull out a hundred dollar bill for those of you that have them. Uh, pull out a hundred dollar bill and usually what happens? Even a 50, sometimes a 20. What will people do? They take a little pen and they mark it to see if it's real. It looks real. But if the, if the pen doesn't tell you that it's real, then it's false. That's called counterfeit. That's why when people uh, are being trained to recognize counterfeit money at the bank, they never show them anything except the real thing. They don't show them counterfeits because then that will confuse them. You just look at what is the real thing and then you recognize the counterfeits. Can I suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, that the real thing is Bible doctrine. The real thing is what is printed here into this scripture uh, revealed to us and then through the means of the Holy Spirit of God so that then we will know what the truth is and we can compare what is the truth with that which is being presented to us and to see is it lying truth, that which appears to be true but is not. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 11, 3. 
But I'm afraid that as the serpent, that is Satan himself, great deceiver, deceived Eve by his craftiness. Your minds, that is the minds of the believers of the church at Corinth, thus written to all of us as believers, will be led astray. Here's what it's talking about in deception, to be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Now we could spend a whole class on that, but let me just point out a couple of things. Espatao is the Greek word. It means to be thoroughly deceived or taken in. The little word ek that's in front of it, it means out from something and into something else, out of truth and into error. If people don't know what the truth is and they're convinced that it is true, they will be susceptible to massive deception. The word emphasizes the end impact or the outcome of deception. Falling into an illusion, missing out on reality. You know, I've said it before, but I, I like to keep repeating it, that people who don't live in reality, we call crazy. Am I right? I mean, if, if somebody tells you that they're, well, in today's world, I guess we're supposed to accept this. If somebody tells you I'm a, I'm a dog, you're supposed to accept them as a dog, but they're still not a dog. They're nuts. I don't care what anybody wants to say. They're not a cat. They're not a furry. They're just nuts. But they're not living in the real world. That defines what is insanity. What happens is, is they, they go into the illusion, missing out of reality, and believe that the unreality is the reality, with the result that they bite on the bait that comes from Satan's hook. And there it is. And they're caught. They're deceived. They're drug away from the Lord. They are taken out of truth and into error. That's why he said that you have been led astray from the, the simplicity, haplotus, the singleness, or without folds, like a piece of cloth. The word means instead of something like this, it's all folded up. Instead of it is just plain and unfolded, it is what it is. It is not having any truth mixed with error. Focus on single-minded faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Comes from what? Knowing doctrine, knowing it is absolute truth, and living in the light of it. Without that, we will buy into lying truth, which of course is not truth, but rather it is deception. 1 John 1, 6. Just go to, you're in Revelation. Just go to your left real quick. 1 John 1, 6. First John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth because he is in the light, verse 7. The reality is, is that believers can walk in darkness. Remember with the uh, the serpents, that little dirty little smudge thing that's out there called carnality, that's the darkness. So if we are saying that we're getting along fine with him, you know, me and God, we type, we're okay. I've had people tell me that as they continue to be determined to live their life like they want. I had somebody that was got mad at us, got mad at me mostly because of some truth I spoke that said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving here and and I said, well, you know, if you leave where the truth is being taught, you're walking away from the Lord. Oh, no. Me, they said this, me and God, we tight. But I'm not going to be back to church. Okay? Deceive yourself if you want to. But you are falling into deception. That's why it says, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, live our life in the darkness of untruth, we lie. We're lying to ourselves. To make it okay to do that. And we're not practicing the truth. So deception, you see, complicates the truth by mixing it with error. I've used this illustration before, but it's a good illustration. Rat poison is composed of 99% good grain. You could eat it. But it's got 1% arsenic. What kills you is the 1%. That's why we have to work so hard to know the truth, to learn the truth, to practice the truth, to master the truth. 
because Satan will slip a deception in and have you think, well, I think I'll go to that church over there. Well, they preach the same thing our church does. Well, they don't believe in eternal security. They don't believe that, that you can have eternal life and know that you have it unless you're living good and you're hanging on to it. But that's okay. I'll just go to that church. Well, you have been deceived. You have been deceived. You, there is no eternal life without the knowledge that you have eternal life and it is unconditional. But what happens is, is error creates doubt. It creates confusion. And it creates that which is appealing to the sin nature. And it comes from Satan himself up on the screen. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. No wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants, that is, pastors and the pulpits, other people that seem to be good people, nice people. I'm a Christian. I go to church. Therefore, I'm a good person. And yet they're promoting false doctrine that leads people straight to hell. Let me tell you something. They also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. But they're not. They're splitting images of Satan, whose end will be according to their deeds. That word disguises, your, your word, your translation may say transform. That's a lot of stuff. I can't say it today. I'm... Yeah, that too. It's just not happening right now. But anyhow, it means to change the outward appearance. And to alter the way you appear, to masquerade. It is different from the Greek word metamorpho. Metamorpho is we can be transformed by the renewing of the minds. Metamorpho means to be changed from the inside out. Listen, Satan does not change his inside. He simply changes his appearance to appeal to you. And let me tell you something. Here's the danger. Satan knows he's been watching you and been watching human beings for a long time. He knows your weaknesses and he'll come at you at your weakness. Now, that doesn't mean that necessarily Satan is messing with you, but the demons know and they're watching you. And they know where your weaknesses are and they'll come at you by your weaknesses. He, but he makes his lies appear as truth and he makes it seem like it's your own good idea. Say, can you show that? You'd never ask. Because John, Jesus said in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil. Now look, you want to do the desires of your father. There's the problem. The lies of Satan, talking to the Pharisees and so forth, the lies of Satan appealed to them, to their desires, because, and it also matched the desires of your father. They wanted to do the same thing that Satan wanted them to do in the rejection of the Messiah. But we have the same problem because Satan will come at us, the world comes at us, the world, the flesh, the devil, uh, to appear to our, our appeal to our old sin nature and make us think that we can, through rationalization, through excuses, through I can't help my little self, I'm a victim, whatever it is, that it's okay to go down this path away from the Lord, away from truth, and into lies, and to do as we want to do. Remember, this is going to happen at the end of the millennial kingdom, but man doesn't change. The perfect environment doesn't change the nature of man. So it says, he was a murderer from the beginning. Did nothing. He went out and stabbed somebody or shot him with a 40, you know, Magnum 44, whatever. Whatever. What's a good pistol to shoot somebody with? Oh, okay, shoot him with a cruise missile, fine. But anyhow, that's not what he's talking about. He murders your spiritual life. He was keeping these people from knowing the truth about Yeshua so that they could have the gift of eternal life. He was killing them for eternity. They will suffer the second death. As believers, he does the same thing to us. He wants our faith to be dead. That is an inoperative faith. It is not leading us into discipleship. 
but rather it's leading us into self-pleasure and self-determination so that then we will go forth and fail at the judgment seat of Christ. He doesn't want the believer to inherit the kingdom. That's what he wants. That's what he's trying to take by force. He certainly doesn't want you to. It says he doesn't stand in truth because there is no truth in him. You see, that's where when he presents himself as a truth bearer, as a minister of righteousness and good, he's lying. That's why it's lying truth. It appears as truth, but it's a lie. When the world comes at you and says, you need to think this way, you need to do this, you need to pursue this, you've got to remember we live in the satanic cosmic system. And as a result of that, it is always presenting falsehood to us, lies to us. The only place you will have the truth is here. The only place you can live the truth is maintaining and having fellowship with the Lord over long periods of time. Amen. Then you will mature in the faith and grow. When he speaks, he speaks from a lie. He speaks from his own nature. He is a liar and the father of lies. For Satan, deception is a means to an end. It's not the goal. Deceiving you is not the goal. It's a means to an end. The end is to overthrow God. The end is always the same for him. From the very beginning, he said, I will be like the most high. I want to have what God has. I want to be in control. Goal of deception towards God is to take his place. Towards unbelievers is to keep him from believing. Towards you is to keep you from inheriting the redemption. Once again, towards God to take his place. Towards unbelievers to keep them from the gift of eternal life. Know how many people are in that category. Haven't you talked to people that need eternal life? You try and tell them about the gift of eternal life and they want to fuss about it. They want to argue. They want to say, no, it's, it can't be that simple. you got to do this and do that and do this and keep that and off you go. And then to keep believers from inheriting the rulership. That's why it's so important. That's why Jesus said what he said, what we talked about in the first class, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see them. Purity of heart is the main maintenance of fellowship over longer and longer periods of time. It is that to have and to hold fellowship, Pastor Chris told us. Being deceived is the inevitable result of living under the dominating influence of our sin nature, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. We will be deceived. Being deceived, inevitable result of living contrary to the word of God. Deception only often starts out very small, but it only gets worse. The more and longer you live in it, the more deception that there is. The creator knows what's best. We don't. Amen. So on the spiritual plane, this relates to the point of self-government. If we live in self-government, we have veered off God's course, which is his, if you will, discovered by because of his orbit of safety. Planao, we have wandered away from it. And that happens even when we get slightly out of God's court. We say, well, I know what the Bible says, but... There's our first step. Here's the bottom line. Whenever any creature, angelic or human, acts independent of God, the consequences will inevitably lead to destructive, devastating destruction. Inevitably. Things are not going to come out like you think they're going to come out. These people at the end of the millennial kingdom are going to follow the deception. They think it's going to come out better than what they had. Now, process that. Better than what they've had. What have they not been allowed to do? Pursue their sin nature openly and dramatically. Because the Lord is ruling with a rod of iron. We're ruling the same way. The sin nature is kept under control. At least outwardly. We'll see it another time. Inwardly, the world is full of rebels.
Independence from God is devastating to individuals, devastating to relationships, devastating to marriages, devastating to families, and devastating to nations. And ultimately, in the, at the national level, it's going to lead us straight into the tribulation period. Not lead us, but lead the world into the tribulation. The spiritual war in the heavens is against God and involves all of humanity. Us, or we are especially the targets. We are center stage as Satan focuses on the church age believer. God's orbit or sphere of safety is Bible doctrine and maintaining fellowship. But deception says, come on, come on, follow me, follow me. Just think this way. And so off we run right into the darkness. Come on, come on, it's okay. You don't have to do what that preacher down at the church says. Listen, you don't, you're right. You don't have to do what I say, but you better do what the Bible says. And I try my best to present that to you clearly and accurately. Bill Winstrom in his gospel ministries made this statement. I liked it so much. I want to share it with you. Failure to obey the word of truth results in deception because there are no other alternatives to the truth except the lies propagated by the kingdom of darkness. Amazingly, the people at the end of the millennial kingdom are going to end mass come against the Lord. Jeremiah 32, 33, in a little different context, but talking about getting ready to go into the Babylonian captivity, but nonetheless applies to what is here because during the millennial kingdom, the Lord himself is going to be teaching. I'll tell you that in a second. People will know the truth. They'll know absolutely the truth. They're going to know that Satan is going to be released. They're going to know he's going to live in deception, but they're going to follow him anyway. Jeremiah 32, 33, how many believers today would apply or should apply this to our lives. They have turned their back to me and not their face. Though I taught them teaching again and again, they would not listen and receive instruction. That's going to be at the end of the millennial kingdom. You know, it's, it's, uh, what's that old thing from the, or what's that movie? The Hobbit? The city, not the city. Your kids ever do that to you? <laughs> Not little, the King James isn't there yet. Your kids may look at you and smile, but inside they're going nuts. Y'all would never do that, would you, Seth? Bannon? No, you're never that. Now, be careful, mom's right there looking at you, too. If you want a good lunch, you better just get yeah, agree that you've done it. <laughs> Confession's good for the soul. James 1, 21 and 22, therefore put it aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, that means maintain that fellowship. Have that fellowship with the Lord over longer periods of time. First on one nine, yes, but then learn what it means to master the sin nature. In humility, receive the word implanted. Let the word of God through the spirit of God become the living reality in your life, which is able to save your souls. In other words, your life will have meaning, value, and purpose and time, which will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. But prove yourselves, demonstrate to yourself, doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Well, isn't that interesting? We delude ourselves. Paralogizomai is your Greek word. It means to reason falsely or incorrectly. We've thought about it. We've reasoned that it's going to be okay. It makes sense to us. It appeals to us. And so we go down that path, but yet what has happened? We have deluded ourselves. We're not thinking correctly. It means to deceive from close to side or conveys a distorted reasoning. It seems plausible, but then later it lets you down. There's the destruction. There's the disappointment. Applying human viewpoint and not the divine viewpoint always results in disappointment and defeat and destruction. Just made this slide for you that deception is presented to the believer. We have a choice to either follow God's divine viewpoint, the word of God, or Satan's human viewpoint. And if we decide to follow Satan's human viewpoint, you can say this based on the word of God that we just read. I accept deception. As a result, I deceive myself. See, that's how it's going to be with Satan. He is the deceiver, but all he can do is present it. We've got to buy into it. These people will be buying into the lie. 
It will be presented as light and as truth and as good. They're going to buy into it. And they will deceive themselves. So much so that they're going to mask themselves as an army. With the demons, I believe. To attack the God of the universe. They forgot all about Armageddon. The whole campaign. Forgot all about Gog and Magog. Talk about that in the history. They have been taught it. But instead they're just like. Oh, this sounds good to me. It's like this. Deception. Here's the process of deception. Deception is presented. Deception is accepted. There is the choice. Just because it's presented. Doesn't mean you have to accept it. And if deception is accepted. It always destroys. Always. Always destroys. Let's look real quick at the five groups of people, both now and the future, that are deceived. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5 real quick. He says this. He's talking about inheriting the kingdom of God. Inheriting the kingdom of God is that reward status of the glorified body, living in the new Jerusalem, a co-inheritor with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in 5 and 6, For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person, uh, that is the person who's living by, by their sin nature, or covetous man who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you. Stop. Notice the word let no one. That means it's a choice. Let no one deceive you um, with empty words. Empty words. Words like the wind. Words that have no value. It may make sense. It may seem logical. But they're empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Listen to me. The sons of disobedience, we'll look at this later on too, but doesn't always mean an unbelief because many believers are sons of disobedience. And in the scripture, son of often means life. You're like that person. You know, it's like Jesus, Jesus said, you are the son of Belial, you're a son of Satan. It means they're like Satan. So in this case, we are the sons, that we are like disobedience. We, who is the great one who heads up disobedience? Satan himself. Believers. Colossians 2.8. Turn to the right, Colossians 2.8 real quick. Let me read that for me. See to it, it's Colossians 2.8. You there? Say amen. Colossians 2.8. See to it, see to it, see to it. That's a choice. It's based upon knowing what the truth is. Let no one take you captive through philosophy and empty deception. The word deception there is apate. It means delusion or that which is wrong appearing as that which is right according to the tradition of man rather than to the ele uh, according, excuse me, according to the elementary principles of the world, which is the satanic cosmic system rather than according to Christ. It's empty deception. It's hollow. It's meaningless. It will not get you from where you are to where you think you want to be. These people, when they're coming up, even though they have read the book, they've been taught the book. They've been told that there is a rebellion that is coming. They have been told that, at the, that when that rebellion happens, that they're going to be destroyed in a flash of light. And they come up anyway because they won't believe it. And how does it end? In a massive flat. It's over. Gone. The unbelievers have gone to hell. They will stand at the great white throne. The believers have lost any reward they would have had. They'll be with the Lord and they stand before his evaluation that follows that at some point, maybe a part of the great white throne, something that follows. They will not be able to experience all that God has planned for them and will spend eternity in the 
So here's the five groups as we hurry to the end. When you see all of these people in Revelation 20 coming up against it, I believe that it can be safely argued that one, many of them are unbelievers. Even though they have lived in that perfect environment, they have heard the word of truth. They are still refusing to believe in Jesus for eternal life. If we, our understanding of Isaiah is correct, all of these will be under the age of 100. But then there will be believers. Remember we studied in Jude about believers. Three different categories. Believers who are questioning. Believers that were never disciples. Believers, discipleship quitters. Believers deceiving others. They're, they're the ones, all of them even now, are those who are open to deception. Questioning. Questioning is not, not accepting the truth of the scripture. They say, well, I understand that. And it's, it's not just asking questions for clarification, but it's asking questions for confrontation. And then it goes on, believers who were never disciples. You can just jot down this scripture, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. This is the unbelievers. They refuse to believe in the truth of eternal life. They replace truth with lying truth. They are never in God's orbit of safety. They never have eternal life. The three categories of believers in Jude 22 and 23 we studied. I was going to go there today, but I've only got about five minutes. We saw these as those who are The believers who are doubting. Then there's, we broke it down into two different groups. Believers who are never disciples and believers who are discipleship quitters. And then it becomes believers who are dangerous. They're doubting, defiant, and dangerous like a sliding scale. The defiant, they never were disciples or they started discipleship but they quit. They become dangerous because they start leading other people away from the truth. We saw that in Jude 22 and 23. Two steps to deception. People who are unsure of God's will of safety. They're unsure of the word of God. They question the essential truths of the scripture. They're unstable in all their ways. They can easily be led astray if not open to being helped from the word of God. The, those who are doubting, they have questions. They're seeking understanding. But the word diacrino in the middle voice means they want to contend with the truth. They, they, it is a going back and forth. They're not affirming. They're unstable in their doctrine. And then from Ephesians 4, 17 to 20, Ephesians 4, 17 to 20, you have believers who were never disciples. They, re, they are born again. They have eternal life, but they refuse to disciple. It's too hard. It's too demanding. I don't have the time. Whatever the excuses are, yada, yada, yada. They're not in God's orbit of safety. And discipline is going to come. They refuse to learn the truth. They're defiant to the word. And they're replacing truth with lying truth. And then 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 4. Hebrews 3, 12. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 4. Hebrews 3, 12. These are uh, believers who are discipleship quitters. They wander out of God's orbit of safety. They're reluctant to learn the truth. They reject the truth they have learned. They have become defiant and they replace it with lying truth. And then finally, in June 23, you have believers who are dangerous. They begin to draw others out of God's orbit of safety. All of the above are the steps to their deception. But they're persuasive and dangerous to other believers because they want to lead them astray. I have seen it happen so many times that there's someone who's in the church. They decide not to become a not, not become a disciple. They wander away from discipleship. And one of the things it seems like it's almost inevitable. They're going to attempt to pull other people along with them to affirm that they're doing okay. We've all seen it happen. They're the ones that lead others to deception. And they're the believers who are dangerous. I'd love to go on, but we're out of time. Let me just end with this. You see, the release of Satan, we'll look at next, in two weeks, doesn't come as a surprise. 
It also should not be a surprise to you that Satan is active and well on planet Earth right now today. Satan is active and deceptive right now today. Right now today, he's attempting to keep unbelievers from believing. He's attempting to cause believers to quit or never disciple to begin with. He uses the same tactics that he used all the way back at Adam and Eve. You, Adam, I mean, uh, with Eve, he said, you will be as God. Now, one part of that being as God is you make your own decisions and live like it. God is always perfect in what he does. Guess what? We're not. So we have to follow his word. But with that, beloved, our time is out. And we will come back to this next time, and I'll show you how it says that there's not a single person on planet Earth that will not know and anticipate what is coming, that will not know the truth, and yet they're going to repel it. Pretty remarkable. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this all too short a time around your word to consider what deception is. To consider deception is lies appearing as real. And how we as believers can be deceived because we allow ourselves to be deceived. Even we want to be deceived because it satisfies our sin nature. We want to live life on our own terms rather than yours. Father, I thank you for all those here at Westside, online, and those who will be listening through Rumble or YouTube that are disciples. The vast majority, if not everybody at Westside, is a true disciple seeking to follow you, seeking to learn your word, seeking to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we know that for some of us, we're a long ways from maturity, but we're advancing. If we look back and look at where we were last year at this time, we'll see how we have grown in the faith, stronger than we And we thank you for that. Thank you for your word and your spirit that makes that possible. You get all the glory. You are transforming us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we can rule and reign with him. But Father, also we know that it's reality of the world in which we live that there's great deception. We all need to be extremely aware of it and realize as appealing as it may be, the end is always destructive. The outcome is not good. Both in time, especially at the judgment seat of so, Father, I pray that you will give us all pause to ask ourselves, how are we doing in our discipleship? Are we growing? Are we advancing? Are we experiencing greater and greater mastery of the sin nature? Are we being open and honest with you? Are we seeking your face? If not, thank you that you always give fresh starts. So, Father, I thank you for the side. Thank you for all who are listening here online. Thank you for Westside, Florida. Thank you for Westside in Wales and Nigeria and Pakistan, all the different places around the world. We thank you. We pray that we will all keep ever in front of us the glories of the word of God, the glories of what it means to have fellowship with you, to walk in the light and to avoid the darkness. And when we mess up, we fess up, and get back quickly and then learn to maintain that fellowship. Thank you for the attention that each person has shown here today. For it's the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, and our soon coming King. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God is good and all the time. Thank you, Lord. For saving my soul, thank you for making me whole, thank you for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. 
I want to thank especially Aunt Lulu for her being present here today and playing for us. In spite of the fact that, for those of you who don't know, she fell, she hurt herself pretty dramatically. She's bruised up in places she says, you ain't never going to see. And, and it hurt her to play. That's why we had everything on video today. But she decided to play at least uh, Bless America for us. And I thank you for your sacrifice and for your faithfulness. Amen. And thank all of you for your faithfulness, your sacrifice your presence, your attention, your desire to want to learn. And I'm very, very glad I get to be your pastor. Keep me in prayer also that we will continue to run with endurance the race that is set to us. I've got a Bible conference coming up in September and I'm hopefully behind it. So you pray for me, will you? <laughs> that God is good and all the time. I commend you now to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and peace be with you. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. All God's people said, Amen. Anybody believe in prayer? Sister Paula, come on. Come up and lead us in prayer as we close. We can stand for closing prayer and then you'll close.